Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 629. How American Medicine Changes Its Mind. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. I'm Dr. Kathy Maupin, and today we're going to talk about um, a serious but somewhat uh, entertaining subject that you should take to heart when you think about the advice that you're, that you're given by medicine or government or your doctor, uh, and advice that when you hear it, it, it just doesn't ring true with your experience. And How do we know what to believe and what not to believe? But before I go through that, I'd like to um, give you uh, an example from the history of medicine, which is um, one of the things that doctors believed in the 1800s, all the way up to 1900s, early 1900s, was that physicians should not wash their hands in between taking care of patients. In fact, it was such a huge deal that when a doctor um, named Semmel, Semmel Weiss had found through his research that we had bacteria and on our hands that could be transferred from one patient to another, and he then started washing his hands in the OBGYN suite of his hospital in between patients because he felt that these bacteria were being transferred between patients every time vaginal, they did vaginal checks like we do now when people are in labor to see if they're about to deliver or not, or if there's a problem, which way the baby's facing, that kind of thing. They did that, they didn't wear gloves, and they didn't wash their hands in between patients. So if you went to the hospital, and this is where that belief that going to the hospital to deliver a baby might be dangerous, It really isn't. It's much safer than delivering at home. But in those days, if you went to a hospital and delivered in a ward of patients, if somebody next to you or down the line had strep or childbed fever and the doctor checked each one of you in the row, the doctor spread the fever. And many, many, many women died because of this. Well, when Dr. Semmelweis came up with the germ theory and the theory that you should be washing your hands to get the germs off your hands before you touch another patient, he was thrown off staff. The hospital literally ostracized him. All the medical groups ostracized him, told him he couldn't practice. He wasn't able to, I mean, his his life was in fighting for this germ theory and fighting for women not to die in childbirth. He literally lost his reputation. He lost his hospital practice. And he had a hard time finding another practice that he could actually work with other doctors who then believed in him. Now, of course, you know that the germ theory is real and that no doctor would go from one patient to another without washing their hands and putting on gloves. So you can see how far they were off at that time. I realized that was the dark ages, but believe it or not, they're far off on some things now as well. And these things actually touch our lives, just like it touched those women's lives that were dying because they were being in, um, in basically um, exposed to it, bacteria as they were being checked in the hospital. So we don't have that problem now, but the things that we have been told by medicine are, are in general not necessarily fact. So let's think about... Um, We'll think about another thing that was told to our parents, or my parents, your grandparents probably. So uh, in the 1960s, late 50s, there was a belief that you should not drink water with your meals, that you shouldn't drink fluids with your meals, that that somehow disturbed 
the digestion of your of that food, which is absolutely wrong now. We know that. But they actually believed it. In fact, they did a 50-year-ago-today um, uh, page in the Journal of the AMA, which described how dangerous it was to drink water with your meal. Now, most of us wouldn't have a meal without water or some other drink, iced tea or something like that, to help us both swallow, but also to help us digest our meal. So that was a true belief. My parents believed it. I mean, they never stopped believing it from the time they were told that it's, it, it was appropriate to the time they died, which was long after everybody had realized that, now nah, you need to drink water with your meal. <laughs> So, I mean, that, those are two off the wall, but two different century obvious mis, um, uh, misdirections by the Institute of Medicine. Now, we get to 2002 and we get to the, the um, WHI study that said, all hormones are terrible, get off your hormones, basically. That's what, that's what the headlines showed. And um, they, just as background, they, my patients were like miserable, calling, crying because they didn't have their hormones. And we never stopped pr providing hormones for our patients. That, this is back when I was practicing GYN and OB. We still pr gave our patients hormones when they needed it. We didn't listen to that sto study because we had so much experience giving women hormones in many different ways, patches, bioidenticals, vag tabs, things like that, we knew that the things that they told us, that they said, oh, breast cancer will be more common, or heart attacks will be more common, or high blood pressure will be more common if you give somebody uh, hormone replacement therapy. So we knew that if we just get, gave patients non-oral estradiol or estradiol only without the Provera, that they had less breast cancer. They had less problems, they had lower blood pressure, they did, not, they did not have more heart attacks if they were on estradiol. In fact, in, uh, in our practice, it was less than the people who were on nothing. Well, we had to wait 20 years. So in, this, in the past journal of um, menopause, journal of the North American Menopause Society, uh, and this is in, um, this is in the last year and a half, they found that, um, that the WHI was flawed and that, <laughs> and that, in fact, if you take estradiol, estrogen alone, even Premarin, that your risk of heart disease, blood high blood pressure, and breast cancer are lower than people who take nothing. So they finally published it that if you, if you do take these things after menopause, you actually have a lower risk life for all of these different diseases. Now, some forms of estrogen are better than others. However, if you take Provera with the estrogen of any type, Provera increases your risk of heart disease, increases your risk of, of um, breast cancer, increases your risk of high blood pressure. Therefore, why didn't they just say Provera is the problem and maybe take it off the market, put on a natural progesterone like what we use, uh, Prometrium, something like that, which is very safe. But Provera is not progesterone. It's a, it's a progestin, and it is, does cause all of these other problems. They actually told us to stop taking something that was helping us, and, not, and they didn't specify whether we were hysterectomy patients that could just take estrogen, or whether we should be taking estrogen plus a different kind of progesterone if we had a uterus. None of that was said until now. So that's 20 years that it took for us to go from the WHI study to saying, oh, hmm, people are living longer with estrogen. People are, are basically having fewer diseases of aging with estrogen. And now it's, of course, not a big headline study. It's just in the journals that I read. And it wasn't even the top, top um, article in this journal. So, so I'm not sure how many people are reading it. In any case, this is another thing they told you to go off. Now they tell you, oh, we were just kidding. 
you know, for all those people during the last 20 years who went off and could have had the benefits of estrogen, estrogen helps you with osteoporosis. I mean, it, and in a, an article that just came out last month, there's, there is um, an article but also in the, menop in the menopause magazine that said that if your lifetime, the title was your lifetime estrogen exposure improves your cognition in late life, meaning it delays dementia and it helps you remember things and it helps your brain to stay healthy. It's when we don't take estrogen after menopause that we're at higher risk of having um, dementia and having Alzheimer's disease. Now, in my practice, we add testosterone to our patients' pellets. We have both estradiol and testosterone pellets. We use both, and testosterone even delays the onset of, de of uh, dementia even farther, even more. Us they usually say 10 years uh, to delay um, dementia if you take estrogen straight through, and 10 years if you take testosterone as well. So that's a 20-year delay in getting dementia or um, cognitive defects. So estrogen really is a good thing for women and really is something that we should be taking, but for that period of time, and maybe still now, because people still come in asking me about this, then we'll have to worry about whether somebody got misinformed and whether they believe me or they believe their doctor who hasn't read anything in 30 years. You know, I don't know. I mean, that's, it, it, it's, I guess, um, since they can't read a medical article and tell themselves, they have to hear it translated. But, but these are the medical articles. The one that was in the, um, the one about cognition and estrogen was in the, let's see, I'm looking for the date. That's, um, that's the 2019 one. That's the one that uh, came out a few years ago. The one uh, that just came out in 2023 was the one that I quoted you about um, women having, if they took estradiol, they had a lower risk of heart disease, high blood pressure, and breast cancer than women who took nothing, and a lot lower than women who took estrogen plus um, Provera or medroxyprogesterone. So those are two things that basically um, come through our office every day. People who don't believe that we're telling the, them the truth that the estrogen is not uh, something that's going to cause them to have breast cancer. So I just want I want to say that now, just so I don't have um, <laughs> I don't have anybody worrying about it when they take it because they're doing something good for themselves. They're not doing something bad. And, and it should, you shouldn't still believe this. Um, there's a book called um, Do Lies My Doctor Told Me. And this is basically has a chapter on each particular thing we were told was true, which is not true. And it was uh, published uh, a few years ago. So a lot of this new research isn't in there. Now, let me go back to another thing. Go way back to, well, actually way back, but it still continues today, that um, doctors are taught that women are hysterical and then that they just need a psychiatrist. Basically, if we complain about something that a doctor doesn't know how to fix or treat or hasn't been trained in, then we're either told that's aging, get used to it, or you're, you're hysterical, you need to see a psychiatrist. And, and that still happens today because I have people coming in my office who are told hormones aren't going to help you, you need to see a psychiatrist. They take a few medications from a psychiatrist, they're not better. Then they come to me, they get their hormones, and they're better. I mean, clearly, it wasn't hysteria, and it wasn't just aging. It was they needed, they had an estrogen or a testosterone deficiency, and they needed to have it replace. And when they did, they're back to normal. Um, hysteria is a way that, um, I mean, it's, it's been used forever. It's been used as an excuse for women's behavior. It's been it's used as an excuse for our suffering during PMS. Uh, and even in um, nowadays, I don't believe the American College of OBGYN still says PMS is a progesterone deficit, which it is. They still say you need to see a psychiatrist. So this is not something that is, that is uh, old or was 
only in the 1800s or early 1900s. It is something now, but but hysteria, um, there's a, actually a, a hilarious movie about hysteria, and it talks about the um, a doctor who um, fixed hysteria by bringing women into his office and actually manu manually manipulating them into orgasms. The reason they were hysterical is because they were unfulfilled because it was sex in that era was all about men. Men, if men got satisfaction, great, but women weren't supposed to like sex. So they made it a medical procedure for women to come in and be in stirrups like you would in a GYN's office and be manually manipulated into an orgasm and then they felt better and then they left. But they didn't say they were being, tr they were treating sexual dysfunction due to partner's problem. They said they're treating hysteria because of course only women can be hysterical. Did you know that? It, it's part of the definition. So, <laughs> So that's another uh, tragedy in, in medicine, although this one doctor figured out how to treat it. Um, that was the minority of the women in that era had to just suck it up and, and be sexually frustrated. So that's, that's another one of the things that I, I find to be um, one thing that me medicine believes and the truth is still out there. <laughs> um, statins versus... Uh, Cardiac calcium scans, basically uh, last, last week's um, video was about the statin belief and the beliefs that statins, everybody should be on statins to prevent a heart disease, which is not necessarily true, and um, that high cholesterol is equivalent to heart disease. So that's how they scare people into taking a statin. But it's not. I test as many people... I, I mean, the results on my cardiac calcium scan have as many people who have high cholesterol with nothing in their arteries as I do people who have normal cholesterol but a family history and have a lot of plaque in their arteries when we do a cardiac calcium test. I don't really think people should be on a statin until, unless they've had a heart attack or a stroke, unless until they have a cardiac calcium scan to prove they actually have plaque to prevent more, to prevent more accumulation of plaque. But for the last, as long as I can almost remember, so the la at least the last 30 years, we've been told that statins are the end-all, be-all, and they will cure heart disease uh, by putting people on them. And it causes a lot of problems. It's high risk. It can cause diabetes. It can cause uh, muscle destruction of the muscle, depending on your genetics. Um, it can even cause dementia because we need cholesterol for our brain. Our brain is always replacing cells, and our brain is mostly cholesterol. So if your cholesterol is too low, you can't repair your brain, and when people are on statins for any period of time, they can actually get dementia. So the thought of, oh, statins, statins are for everybody, is still in the minds of most cardiologists and most um, internists, and it's just simply not true. It needs to, they need to Re read the research, read the other, the newest articles on the side effects of this, and then, and then decide whether they want to believe it or not. If they don't believe it, they're still not going to um, take patients off statins who don't need need the statins. So there's there's this huge there's this huge change and the huge dichotomy of what we're told and what is real. And the only way I can I can help you is you can either read something or or hear something from your doctor and say, does that ring true? And just use your gut instinct and say, if it doesn't ring true, then ask more questions. Ask about research. Ask about some of the things that I've told you about. If they get angry, then I would just say they're probably not who you need to see. You need to see somebody different. And if they uh, will consider it, look it up, whatever, then it's possible that they can work with you through getting you treated the way you want to be treated because 10 years from now, they'll probably say that only people who have had a heart attack should be on that drug because the risks outweigh the benefits. But I don't know what, when that will be or who will make the decision. However, these are things that are still going on. They're not to be just in the uh, last two centuries. They're still, this is still happening. And, um, a research paper doesn't necessarily 
prove true, you have to compare it to your experience. And as a physician, I compare every one of these research papers to what I see in the office. So I have a, a, an easier way to check them than someone who is a patient and doesn't have that knowledge. You really have to have medical background to really read these articles and also to compare them to many people so that you can see if this, this works for you or not. So I guess you have to just compare everything to your own experience or the, that of your family. So you can't believe everything that doctors tell you. You should always consider that um, it may be changed in the future and you have to decide what's right for you. So I hope this helps you discern whatever you hear through the news. And a news bite isn't everything. Usually you have to read the article. The news bite doesn't necessarily tell you the truth. So um, I'm hoping that this will help you protect yourself from medical practices that someday will be um, reversed and that uh, aren't helping you at this stage. So thank you for listening. I will see you next week. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.